All right, here we are, and I am excited to be kind of launching this here in this mile marker year of our church as we get ready to celebrate our 20th year anniversary. And we have here archives from the pulpit of the Lincoln Baptist Church. What we've done, and Brother Looper's helped with this, is we've gone back and we have pulled some of the old CDs of preaching from years past here at Lincoln Baptist Church. We've taken those, we've converted them into MP3s, and then now we are bringing some of them and, and sharing them with you here. And so this first message I want to share with you in this series was preached by preacher uh, several years ago, many years ago, uh, long before I was pastor. It's actually a message he preached, I believe, a couple different times when he was the pastor here. And uh, the title is this, Does God Still Love America? message is about 40 minutes long, and I hope that you'll sit back and enjoy this morning as we listen to Preacher, Preaching Does God Still Love America? Second Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 15. Give me another moment to find that. have that, we'll have you stand and stretch for a moment in honor for the reading of God's Word. Second Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 15. The Bible says this, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Verse 17, Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. And tonight I'm going to preach you a message called, Does God Still Love America? Does God Still Love America? Let's pray, and then you may be seated. Heavenly Father, Lord God, tonight... I pray that you'd come and teach us a great truth here, Father, about our country. And I love our country tonight, Father. I love America. And I believe these people that are here with me tonight love America, Father. And I just pray tonight, Father, that you'd come and teach us now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. These verses that we just read show the compassion that God still has for a nation. Still has compassion, he does. The nature of the sermon tonight will be similar to last Sunday night's sermon, as in it's going to require the reading of a lot of quotes. So there'll be a lot of reading involved, not on your part, but on mine, a lot of listening on your part. But uh, let me give you some things as a way of introduction here, and then we'll give you some points. I want to say this. During the Civil War time, uh, President Lincoln had just listened to a very negative report of the Union Army suffering great loss uh, in uh, battle, and uh, one of uh, President Lincoln's aides uh, turned to him and responded, uh, saying, or, or turned to him and said this, just whose side is God on anyway? And President Lincoln responded with the statement, I am less concerned with whose side God is on and more concerned if we are on God's side. And I want to say tonight that God has blessed this old nation of ours he protected us in our revolution time. He was with us when we were young as a nation. He helped us grow. He blessed all along. He forgave us during our times of ignorance in the past. And he has certainly put his punishment on us when we've been too prideful at times, I think, as a nation. But tonight I want to give you some of the fingerprints of God on our nation during its 
times of history. I'll give you several things tonight. Number one is this, God loved us in our beginnings. That'll be our first point tonight. God loved us in our beginnings. He loved us in our beginnings. Christopher Columbus lived from 1451 to 1506, and he said this, and I do quote, uh, Our Lord Jesus blessed us in our sailing to the West Indies. I spent several years in the royal court discussing the matter with many people of great reputation and of certain wisdom about such matters in all the arts. In the end, they all concluded that it was foolishness, so they gave it up. Since all things predicted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, have always come to pass, I also believe that this particular prophecy will also come to pass. He then quotes some verses from Matthew chapter 24, and then he says this. He says, I am a most unworthy sinner, crying up to the Lord for grace and mercy. In my journey to the Indies, I did not make use of mathematics or maths. It is simple the fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied. All this is what I desire to write down for you in this book. No one should fear to take any task in the name of our Savior. The working of all things is done by our Lord according to his sovereign will. That's a pretty good start for a future nation. Pretty good start. Of course, he's referring to the book of Isaiah, talking about how the world is, is basically the world is round uh, in uh, circular motion. And so that's what he's referring to. So he took the, he didn't, he didn't go by what the experts of the day were saying because they were all saying the world was flat, but instead he went by God's word and he made some good statements there. Tonight I'm preaching this message because over the years, we've seen, especially since 9-11, I think, but over the years, uh, we've seen the book of Revelation come open and come to life like never before in our world and in our societies uh, around the globe tonight. And, uh, and I think some of the things we see happening are just incredible. And I think it's easy to see how, uh, how God's plan is coming to pass and, and so forth. Uh, and I see a lot of uh, uh, combining of things underneath the name of safety and peace in our society today. A lot of combining. The combining of non-Christian, wannabe Christians, so-called Christians, and Christian voices. And they all get together and they have their prayer meetings and their prayer groups and so forth. Uh, but the problem is you can't just lump up with everybody if you don't believe the same thing. Amen is right. You can't just lump up with everybody if you don't all believe the same thing. Uh, a while back, it was several years now, I guess, uh, they had a, a Muslim leading a prayer group in Washington, D.C. Folks, this isn't a Muslim nation tonight, and it was never founded as a Muslim nation. We do not believe the same things that a Muslim believes. Now, I'm not against the people. I'm for them being saved one day. I think they need to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but we are not a Muslim nation tonight. I do not believe that the Muslims should be in the leadership roles of spiritual things in our society. Uh, I believe it's a Christian nation, and therefore I believe Christians ought to be the ones doing the leading tonight, and, uh, and that's the way it ought to be, uh, and that's exactly the way the Lord would want it. Uh, to be. Uh, now, <clears throat> when they led in prayer, they weren't allowed to do one thing at that meeting I was just mentioning. They weren't allowed to close in Jesus' name. Really? Then who were they praying to if they weren't allowed to use his name? You know why they didn't want to use his name? Because all the groups that come together, they don't all believe in Jesus the same way. Let me say this tonight. I believe Jesus is the perfect Son of God. I believe Jesus is not only was 100% man, but I believe he was 100% God. Amen. I believe that he was sinless, perfect, spotless. Uh, I believe he was the Lamb of God and that he was the sacrifice for our sins and that his shed blood was necessary for salvation. And without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins, the Bible says. Amen. And so I believe tonight that Jesus Christ is all those things. I cannot, nor will I, lump up with people who do not believe in the way that I believe about Jesus. I cannot. How could I get together with them and pray? What would we pray about? Who would we be praying to if they do not accept Jesus for who he is? They have to accept him for who he is, and that's the perfect son of God and 100% man, but 100% God he was. And, uh, and that's important to remember tonight. This was founded as a Christian nation. Number two tonight. We said, number one tonight, God loved us in our beginnings. Number two tonight, God loved us in our justice. God loved us in our justice. Supreme Court Justice Brewer wrote this, I believe in Jesus Christ as the great helper and savior of humanity. 
And the Holy Bible is bearing to us the story of his mission, the rules of his duty, and the revelation of eternal life, the condition of which he came into that life are possible. No other book contains more truths. Would to God he were sitting on the bench today. Yes, sir. Amen. Unfortunately, he's not. He died some time ago, obviously. How about John Jay tonight? Another one would be good to be on the bench tonight. Former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court course of the United States of America. On October 12, 1816, John Jay said this, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. It is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. That's not me saying that tonight. That's not even a Baptist preacher saying that tonight. That is a Supreme Court justice and the head one at that, the Chief Justice, saying that in 1816 in our nation. And he wasn't even a Baptist. He was a Christian, but he wasn't even a Baptist. But he had the right idea. He had the right idea. Now, he goes on to say uh, later, uh, May 13, 1824, actually, uh, he makes this statement, by conveying the Bible uh, to people, we most certainly do them great kindness. Thereby we are enabling to learn that man was originally created and placed in a state of happiness, but upon becoming disobedient and was subjected to the evils which he and his posterity have since experienced, the Bible will also inform them that our gracious creator has provided for them a redeemer in whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This redeemer has made an atonement for the whole world. Through his divine mercy, he has opened a way for us to have salvation and that these benefits are the free gifts of God, not of our own power to earn or deserve. That's a good, solid Baptist teaching, even though he's not a Baptist. That's pretty good belief right there. Pretty good statement right there. He goes on to state this, uh, that he has adopted no beliefs from any denominational creeds, but upon careful examination of the Bible, he has found that these things... To, he found these things to be true. Once at a party in Paris, John Jay was asked this question if he believed in Christ, and he said this, I did, and I thank God that I did. Not a bad start for a nation. Pretty good chief justice of the Supreme Court there. Another individual, Jeremiah Sullivan Black, United States Attorney General, underneath President James Buchanan, in August 1881, he wrote uh, in the North American Review this statement, As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ died so that sinners might be reconciled to God. He died for them so that they could escape divine justice from which their crimes had provoked a man whom by any means that caused his own offense to be visited on the head of an innocent person is unspeakably depraved. But are Christians guilty? of this basis because they accept the blessings of an institution for which their benefactor died to establish, he's talking about a New Testament church, uh, loyalty to the king who erected a most magnificent government for us at the cost of his life, speaking of Christ, he was there, uh, fidelity to the master who brought us, who bought us with his blood is not the fraudulent substitution in place of the criminal. You understand what he's doing there? He's bragging about Jesus is what he's doing. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Sir William Blackstone, renowned English jurist, says this. He was a key figure, by the way, in helping establish, uh, helping establish law in America and was one of the foundational authors of, of law today. Uh, but Blackstone writes this statement. Uh, the belief of a future of rewards and punishments, the belief of just ideas being one of the main attributes of the supreme being, the idea that he will justly compensate every action in life all which are review in the doctrines of our Savior, Christ. These are the grand foundations of all judicial oaths which call God to witness the truth of those facts, which perhaps may know only to him and the party attesting all evidence and confidence in human velocity will be weakened by apostasy and overthrown by total infidelity. Wherefore, all insults to Christianity or endeavors to depreciate its authenticity are deserving Oh, look at this, of censorship. Are deserving of censorship, he says. So in other words, anybody who criticizes Jesus should be punished or whipped for it or whatever you want to say. That's what he's saying. Number three, how about this? God loved us in our education. God loved us in our education. 
And uh, let me read you a few of the founding tenets of Harvard University here, founded in, did in, uh, founded in 1636 uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, by the way, that was started to train uh, illiterate clergymen is why it was even started to begin with, Harvard, uh, and many of the uh, Ivy League schools that way. Uh, let me give you this. Rules and precepts as of September 26, 1642. Let me give you just three of them here. Uh, number one, let every student be plainly instructed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And then he references John 17, 3. Uh, and then it states, and therefore to lay Christ on the bottom is the only foundation for sound learning. That's a good statement. Number two, second uh, rule and precept here. Seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let every man set himself by prayer for seeking of him, meaning God. And he references Proverbs 2, 3. And then thirdly, he uh, gives this, everyone shall so exercise himself in the reading of Scripture every day. He shall give the account of himself in all areas of application and logic in the light of all spiritual truths. The entrance of the word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. And he references Psalms 119, 130. Uh, these are the first uh, three right there of those, of those rules and precepts. First three of them. Yeah, those are pretty good. That last one, you know what he's talking about. He's talking about having a quiet time. He's talking about reading the Word of God every day, man. He's talking about getting in the Bible, reading Scripture, and actually reflecting upon what you read. Uh, that's exactly what he's talking about, and that's a good idea for anybody. It would be today, too. Let me give you another thing here. Timothy Dwight, first president of Yale, makes this statement. Where there is no religion, there is no morality. Where there is no religion, there is no morality. How about William Holmes McGuffey? American educator, founder and starter of the McGuffey Readers. And uh, he gives this statement in 1836. He says, the Christian religion is a religion of our country. From it are derived our prevalent notions. Now, do you suppose in 1836, being not that far removed from revolutionary times, do you think these people had a concept on the founding of our nation? Do you think that? I'll get back to the statement here in a second. But do you think that? Yeah, I think so. How is it they get it and people today don't get it? And they say, well, we ain't a Christian nation. We got a president that says now, we're not a Christian nation. We're a nation of ideas and people. Oh, baloney, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about at all because he doesn't know what our founders knew and what some of these men not all that long after our founders knew. Uh, McGuffey had an idea about the founding of our country, uh, not living so far removed from it. Uh, the Christian religion is a religion of our country. From it derived our prevalent notions, notions of the care of God as the governor of the universe. He goes on to say this, that no little boy or girl should ever drink whiskey or liquor unless they want to become drunkards. From nowhere should we draw more than from the sacred scriptures themselves. The minds of the youth should be indoctrinated with the mind and spirit of God. If that's the case, then why in 1962 did we take prayer out of the public schools? wonder why we did that. We kicked the Bible out. And number four tonight, big number four, God loved us in our Congress. God loved us in our Congress. The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892 by a Baptist preacher, by the way, uh, by a man named Francis Bellamy. Uh, he was from Boston. The words, One Nation Under God, were taken from Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address. And uh, when, when Lincoln makes the statement, uh, This nation under God shall have a new birth. And so that's where they got the words from. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Wonderful Pledge of Allegiance it is. June 14th. 1954, President Eisenhower, a little, little more modern here, uh, gave his support to the Congressional Act, which added the words under God into the pledge permanently by signing it into law. Yeah. Eisenhower said that they were doing it to preserve our heritage and spiritual beliefs of this nation. Congress said God will forever be this nation's most powerful resource during peacetime and wartime pretty good for a Congress in 1954. They also say, Congress that is, uh, or rather in 1954, they set aside a room for use for prayer and meditation 
uh, for the members of the House of Representatives and for the members of the Senate. Uh, it is not open for public use, by the way, and it has an open Bible uh, sitting up there uh, in the front of it underneath a, st a table, underneath a stained glass window with George Washington. I don't know if you've ever seen it with a picture of George Washington in the stained glass window. I've seen pictures of it before. Uh, and, uh, and they've got that there. Uh, with jo and George Washington's actually kneeling, praying in the snow. Uh, but behind him are written the words in Psalm 16, 1, Preserve me, O God, and in thee do I put my trust. By the way, each session begins with prayer. Each session begins with prayer, and each house has its own chaplain. Uh, now, inside the rotundra is a picture of the crucified Christ. The crucified Christ pictured there, as well as a picture of pilgrims, uh, when they were embarking from Holland, uh, and uh, also written on the dome of the Capitol are the very clear words of the New Testament according to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, in 1956, the official motto uh, became, In God We Trust. In God We Trust, the official motto of the United States. Congress, 1834, they designated that chaplains were to pull double duty as preachers and as schoolmasters. So in other words, what were the preachers supposed to do? They weren't just supposed to be the preachers, but they were also supposed to educate the kids. That's what they intended, and that's what they did back then. And uh, so they were schoolmasters also. Uh, in the name of peace, we're trying to bring all nations together tonight and trying to bring all peoples together. But I'm telling you, folks, that can't always work. It can't always work when you do not believe the same thing. Uh, somebody has to understand somewhere that we're supposed to be a Christian nation tonight. The reason why we got to where we were at is because of the fact that the foundation of our country was a Christian nation. A Christian nation. How else could you take something that was just a small group of colonists uh, and, uh, and take it from a small group of colonists to, uh, uh, to a world power in just a very short time? How could that happen? How is it you have other nations tonight uh, that sit as third world countries and they never go anywhere and probably never will? But you know what they don't have? They don't have true Christianity at their core base. And until they do, they won't ever go anywhere to amount to much of anything, probably. God has blessed us because of the fact that we were a Christian nation and are a Christian nation, and we need to make sure we stay a Christian nation tonight. Congress, 1854, Christianity must be considered the foundation uh, on which the whole structure of, our nation, of, of which our nation rests. Jeremiah 51, 7, uh, the Bible says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. America has been a golden cup to God. I think so. Hey, you realize we've sent out more money for foreign missionaries to go across the globe than any other country ever has. We finance that more than anybody. I think that uh, God uses us. Why does God use us? Because I think God loves us. I think he does. That's why, uh, but not because we're so super special, but because of the fact that God loves foreign missions and God loves missionaries getting the gospel out across the world. God loves that tonight. Amen. That's important to God tonight, and so God blesses that. Now, here's the thing. So why are things in our country unraveling? Why are things in our country unraveling? Well, they have been for a while, and here's some reasons why. Let me give you several things tonight. Uh, one, one is this, Abington School District versus Shimp in 1962. One court decision made here. Eight to one, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned a Pennsylvania law that said at least 10 verses from the Bible shall be read without comment at the beginning of each school day. That's the way it used to be pre-1962. Any of you ever remember being in school anywhere and having them read the Bible? One of you? The rest of you didn't go to school, okay. I understand. All right. Some of us aren't old enough to be in school before 1962, so we understand there. But many of you I look at look like you're, well, old enough to be in school before 1962. And uh, Brother Foff was alive before school was invented. And uh, uh, he skipped out and went and fought in World War II. There you go. Let me give you a second court decision. Engel versus Vitel, 1962 also, by the way. Prayer in the public school. A New York Board of Regents had instituted a public daily prayer. They ruled that the government should not involve itself in starting any form of religious practice uh, whatsoever. And so it was thrown out. 
And then number three, I'll give you a third one. And I've addressed, I've addressed this before, and I've got a whole sermon I've preached before on this, but uh, number three is this, Roe versus Wade, 1973. That's another major decision of why our country is unraveling. Roe versus Wade, 1973. It began actually three years earlier in 1970, but there's an unmarried woman in Dallas, Texas, that has an unwanted pregnancy. And uh, just a thought, why is an unmarried woman pregnant anyway? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Those things happen, I know, but it shouldn't be. Uh, we're changing our morals over fornication. That's not a good idea uh, when they began to change that. But here's what happens. Justice Blackman delivered these comments on it. Uh, he says, it has been argued occasionally that these laws, meaning against abortion, was a product of Victorian social concern to discourage illicit sexual conduct. Uh, Texas, however, does not advance this justification in this present case, and no one took this case uh, or argument seriously. End of quote. I wonder if he's ever counseled anybody who's had abor an abortion before. I wonder if he's ever talked to somebody who has. I wonder if he's ever dealt with that. I wonder if he's ever, ever, uh, ever talked to somebody who uh, came to see him and said, listen, so I have nightmares at night because you got up and preached uh, that abortion is straight out of hell and that it's murder to do that, uh, to have an abortion done. I've been having nightmares because I had an abortion done. I wonder if he's ever had to deal with somebody like that. Bless God, folks, what in the fire is the matter with us? We've got a bunch of knuckleheads in there that ain't got enough sense to get the lid off a peanut jar, bless God. Ain't got enough sense about them. Somebody's got to realize that these things are wrong. But they made these decisions. Nine stupid people did. And they're supposed to be scholarly people. Uh, but all, all of our greatness of our nation has been undone, I think, basically over those three major decisions that took place, two in 1962 and one in 1973. And our country's done nothing but gone downhill ever since those decisions have been made. Amen. Somebody say amen. It's the truth. It's done nothing but gone downhill. If you know anything about short-term history, our nation's done nothing but gone downhill since those decisions have been made. Hey, the Bible says that God exalts righteousness. Amen. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people is what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14. Uh, so righteousness lifts up the nation, but sin brings it down. And that's exactly what the problem has been. These are sinful things, and it's not right, and it has caused our country to begin to unravel. But tonight, the question is this, does God still love America? And I believe he does, and I'll tell you why tonight. I believe he does. God, first of all, still calls men into his service. He still calls men into his service. According to those verses we read in the very beginning tonight in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, God still has compassion. He says he has compassion. And by the way, what does he do? He still sends preachers out tonight, and he still has preachers preaching the gospel tonight in the United States of America. Amen. Secondly, Christians still respond to the voice of God. Christians still respond to the voice of God. Here's the thing. We have people here tonight. Oh, we're not the largest church in town, but to be honest with you, most churches don't even meet on Sunday night. So we got people here tonight. So guess what? Uh, people still do hear the voice of God. Still do. Hey, people still get saved. People still get baptized. This morning, last Sunday, Sunday before, still goes on. Still goes on in a lot of churches all over the country. Uh, people still get saved. People still get baptized. We had people saved Thursday night while we were out soul winning. People still get saved. People still listen to the voice of God and respond to the voice of God. Thirdly tonight, old-time Christianity with standards and values is still alive. Now, it may seem few and far and in between, and it's getting to be more so that way all the time, and it makes me sad, but there is still some people that believe some things from the old black book tonight, and there are still some people who believe in righteousness and the things of God. I thank the Lord tonight that he taught me how to dress like a Christian tonight. I thank the Lord tonight that he taught me how to walk and talk like a Christian tonight. I thank the Lord tonight for the things that he's done for me. I thank the Lord that we still have some places in this nation uh, that still preach out of the same Bible that this nation was built on, the old King James Bible, amen, which is the only accurate Bible in the English language tonight, amen. Uh, preachers still thunder out across the land and preach the gospel, amen. There's still old-fashioned preaching that goes on. Uh, there's still truth being given out. 
from the word of God. God still loves America, I believe. So what does that mean to us tonight, preacher? Well, first of all, it means that we ought to be doing this. Keep doing what the founders did tonight when the blessings were coming down. Keep doing what the founders did when the blessings were coming down. Hey, you know what they did? They were in church. Amen. Not sitting at home on Sunday morning, relaxing in front of the TV set, but they were in church. Bless God on the Lord's day. That's where they were. Hey, do you realize all the executive orders? And I've preached messages on it before. I got a message on George Washington that I preach, and I preached in the past. And all the executive orders that he gave out, bless God, he was commanding his men to go to church on Sundays and try to avoid fighting if you could, so you could be in the Lord's house, wherever you could find one to meet. And if you couldn't find the Lord's house to be in, then the chaplains were to conduct services right there in the camp. And all the men were to attend because they were in church. Amen. Getting together around the word of God and hearing the word of God preach and realizing the importance of being in church and being around the word of God. Got to do what the founders did. Got to do what the founders did. Amen. That's important. When the blessings came down, how do we ever win that revolutionary war? If you've ever studied it out and you've ever seen how it is, we never had a chance the greatest army in the world was the British Army. We didn't have a chance. We didn't have nothing but a ragtag army. Didn't hardly have the weapons or supplies and didn't have the things we needed to beat them by the world standard or by uh, what we would see as physical terms. But wait a minute. Somehow, as the years went by and uh, God began to turn the tables and somehow we began to have a, a general who led us greatly, but he led on his knees, amen, uh, his, George Washington uh, led us greatly and all of a sudden the tables began to turn and we began to win battles that we were never supposed to have won and ended up winning the entire thing in the end and then comes our nation, amen, that we have tonight. So first of all, what it means to us is to keep doing what the founders did when the blessings were coming down. Secondly, tonight is to keep the book alive. Keep this book alive, the Word of God tonight. Read it, study it, meditate on it, spend time in it, know it, memorize it. It's the most important thing. Amen. See, here's the thing. God's give us instructions. It ain't some vision coming down, but he's given it by the way of the Word of God is what he's given. And that's how he speaks to us. And what we've got to do is get in it so we know what it says, so we know what God wants us to do in our lives. See, this book will tell you everything that you need to know. Amen. You just have to study it out. But it's there. And guess what? It's for everybody. You don't have to go through me just to get it. You don't have to go through somebody else just to get it. You can get one out yourself, and you can read it for yourself, and you can spend time in it yourself, and you can study over it and pray over it and, sp and, and get into it yourself. And that's just what God intended for us to do. Keep the book alive. Stand for it. Stand up for it. Number three tonight, keep the standards high. Keep the standards high tonight. Uh, personal standards are important. God intends for Christians to live like Christians. God intends for that. God intends for that. You know, people come to me sometimes. They say, well, we really want, I really want God to bless me in my life. Or, or uh, somebody recently asked me, well, I really want God to bless my relationship. And I, wanna, I, wanna, I want this relationship to be blessed between me and so-and-so here. Well, wait a minute now. They're not married. And they're living together. And they're coming to me and they're saying they want God to bless the relationship. God ain't going to bless that. Right. He's against it. It's called fornication. Amen. It's not right. So guess what? God ain't going to bless that. Hey, it's important for us to keep the standards high. Men ought to keep their hair cut. Women ought to keep their hair long instead of butching it off like a man. Bless God. Uh, men ought to start looking like men. Quit wearing earrings and looking like a bunch of girls and sissies. Bless God. Uh, men ought to be men again in our country the way it used to be. So, boy, I ain't used to all that. Well, that's the problem. You've been going someplace where they don't preach like that. And that's why we have Christians out there that don't look like Christians. A right. Christian ought to look Amen. like a Christian, ought to act like a Christian, ought to talk like a right. Christian. They ought not to be cussing and swearing and telling filthy and dirty jokes Amen. down at the workplace. They ought not to be involved in that. They ought not to be sitting around looking at some pornographic magazine somewhere. That's not Christianity. That's not right. That's not how to salvage a family. That's not how to lead your family and how to be faithful to your wife. That's not right. Hey, guess what? Keep the standards high. 
They used to live a lot more like Christians back in that day and age. Even the lost people used to live more like Christians live today like Christians. What a shame. Hey, how about this? Fourthly, keep pleading with God to spare our land. Keep pleading with God to spare our land. Uh, oftentimes, George Washington is associated in those pictures with kneeling in the snow for prayer. Oftentimes, he's seen in prayer. Amazing. Amazing. That was a man who begged God for help. He was a Christian man. He was a saved man. He begged God for help. You know what the Indians used to say about him? The Indian scouts that worked for the British, they said, we didn't understand the great white chief for the, uh, for the Americans. They said, we couldn't kill him. They said, many a times we tried to take him down. They said, couldn't take him down. Many a times his coats were full of bullet holes, but he had none in his body. One time even a Bible in his vestment stopped a bullet from penetrating into his skin. Hey, guess what? That's a man who begged God. Hey, that's what we need to have is we need to have people who learn how to pray and how to beg God. Beg God for your family tonight. Beg God for our church tonight. Beg God for our society tonight, for our nation tonight. Beg God to bless the way he used to bless once again. Beg God tonight. Hey, how about this tonight? Fifthly, pray for God to call men to be preachers. Pray for God to call men to be preachers. We need preachers. We need men. Where's the Christian men? They're hard to find. We need Christian men, and we need Christian men that'll be preachers for God. That'll help get the gospel out. That'll tell people how to be safe. That want to be involved in living for God and doing a ministry for God and doing a work for God. Hey, we need preachers to be called to ministry tonight. We need for God to call men to be preachers. Amen. Hey, sixthly tonight, act when God moves. When God moves, we've got to act. When God moves on your heart about something, say, well, he ain't been moving on my heart much. Well, then get right, backslider. There's a reason why he ain't moving on your heart, because you ain't letting him, because he wants to move on your heart. I promise you that. He wants you to do what's right. He wants you to follow his word. He wants you to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ if you're lost tonight. Bless God, if God's moving on your heart about your need for salvation, you better come to the altar tonight, and you better get saved, bless God. God wants to move on your heart tonight. Hey, every time we have an altar call, you ought to be moving to the altar to pray and ask God for something special to happen in your heart. Act when God moves on your heart. Act when God moves on your heart. That's important tonight. And that's what it means tonight. There you have it. The message is short, but it's a true one. Does God still love America? Yes, I believe he does. Because of the reasons I stated a moment ago. And what that means to us, I just told you. Tonight, it's our job to act on those things. Let's stand to our feet.